So I think we're getting most of the um, people here. There was a question about recording, Neil. Can you just answer that in the chat? Thank you, Debbie. Um, so welcome to uh, the Transforming Foundation and Network Plus workshop on uh, Foundation Industries 4.0, which we've subtitled Next Generation Intelligent Process for the Foundation Industries. So I think the title is self-explanatory. We're going to look at a, a whole range of uh, um, processes and uh, technologies that can improve the efficiency of manufacturing and thus the energy efficiency and material usage in the foundation industries. And um, it's going to focus extensively on a topic such as digitalization, but it's not exclusively about that and it, is, it does take a wider remit. Can we have the agenda, please? Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the Network Plus. Uh, I'm Professor Rainey, I'm the director of the Network Plus. And then we have two talks in the morning, uh, and those will be from Yukon Hu and uh, Alessandra Parisio. Pas 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 sorry, my apologies, Alessandra, um, who are going to give two talks, and then we're going to have a QA session uh, for 20 minutes after that, a break um, for um, coffee or whatever you wish to do, a bit of food maybe. And then we're going to start again at 11.40 where Julie McCann and Ash Tiwara are going to be presenting in the early afternoon. <clears throat> um, this is the uh, Transforming Foundations' is Network Plus um, Management Group uh, and PI, as I've mentioned. We have the deputy, which is Susan Bernard Lopez from the University of Leeds. I'm from Sheffield. We have William Sampson from the University of Manchester and Cameron Clyde Pierce from the University of Swansea. We uh, cover several aspects of the uh, foundation industry, several sectors in terms of the uh, science underpinning those sectors, ceramics and glass for myself, uh, cements for Susan, paper for Bill and Cameron Metals. Currently we have Chris McDonald as our independent advisory panel chair. He is standing down at the moment, and so we are going to appoint a new independent advisory panel chair in the forthcoming weeks. He's part of the, he's the CEO of the Materials Processing Institute. You've been liaising with Deborah and Neil, who are the marketing officer and network manager, respectively, for the Transforming Foundation Industries Network Plus. Next one, please, Neil. So what is our remit? Um, we try to identify and co-create um, science and technology for sustainability within the foundation and industries. We uh, are agnostic about the technology. What it has to do is make foundation and industries more, inefic more efficient from an energy perspective and must move them towards net zero and minimize waste uh, from those industries. So those are the kind of topics that we are uh, focusing on from a technological point of view. We also deal with equality, diversity and inclusion, and we have a future workshop coming up on that. And we are also need to recognize the, uh, the requirements for policy and advocacy in this area, trying to get the message to the right people, particularly in government where decisions can be made. We have, can you go back, Neil? Thank you. We have around, 469 members uh, and it's a split between the 60% um, uh, academic and 39% industry and to date we've apportioned using our mini project funds, uh, small project funds, around 500k of projects and that gives us 12 current ongoing research projects, the first of which are starting to come to a conclusion now and we'll be getting the reports in and announcing the results of those on our web pages in the near future. Next page, please, Neil. Um, we've done a lot of stuff in the last year and we've got more to come in 22. We launched in January, our launch event was in Feb. We've had a sequence of roadshops and um, uh, small project call announcements. We've recently gone through a second funding call and that has been complete and projects allocated. And we will be announcing a new funding call on Friday. Uh, so please watch the space because there is money available for projects generally in the area of next uh, of intelligent next generation processes. 
We've also had ongoing uh, a, a webinar series called Blue Skies Green the Future, and we've been inviting um, some top researchers around the world to give us their perspectives on the push towards net zero. Next slide, please. Okay, so it remains for me to just introduce the speakers now. Uh, the first speaker is Yukon Hu from uh, UCL, who's going to give a talk on next generation intelligent heating processes for the foundation industries. I believe Yukon is going to share the screen himself and present from his own computer. Is that correct, Yukon? Yes, thank you, Ian. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yikun Hu, an associate professor of infrastructure system at UCL, and also a member of UCL's infrastructure system institute, where I need the energy science research, especially the industry energy efficiency and uh, decarbonization. Today, I'm going to share with my uh, with you some of my thoughts on next generation and intelligent heating processes for foundation industries. When we talk about next generation industrial heating processes, no doubt the main concerns are energy consumption and uh, carbon emissions. Currently, emissions in the uh, industrial sector comprise more than 15% of global emissions, the majority of which are associated with providing heat at temperature of 100 to 1000 degrees Celsius. Aside from providing heat, there are many cases where, ma where one must also compensate for thermodynamic driving force associated with forming CO2 as well. Though each industry poses its own unique challenges, the most uh, significant industries are one, cement, second, iron steel, and uh, aluminum and hydrogen. For heat consumed, electric-based uh, heating only account for 26% and 74% is provided by means of combustion. In particular, high temperature heat, that's about 400 degrees Celsius, accounts for 48%. This includes heating processes in foundation industries like steel reheating and glass melting. Global action is driving innovation and a scale up of technologies to decarbonize the power, building, and the transport sectors. It also reduced the cost of this technology. However, the innovation of decarbonization technologies in the industry sector is relatively slow, and the corresponding costs have not declined. So that the pathway for reducing carbon emission in the industry sector is not as clear as in other sector. Decarbonizing industrial heat is difficult for several, several reasons, I think. First, 45% uh, of carbon emission from raw material cannot be reduced by changing fuels, but only by changing industrial processes. Second, 35% of CO2 emission come from high temperature heating by burning fossil fuel, reducing emissions by switching to alternative fuels such as carbon-free electricity. It's difficult because it requires substantial modification to the bonus design. Third, because industrial processes are highly integrated, changes in any part must be accompanied by changes in other parts of the industry process. And making process changes on an existing site requires a significant investment in rebuilding or retrofitting. The rational mix of decarbonization approaches depends, on, depends heavily on several local factors. Based on interviews and uh, workshops with industry stakeholders and uh, uh, technology suppliers, the use of hydrogen either as a 100% fuel or use as a combination of gas or, or other fuels could uh, potentially be feasible for most applications, uh, followed by, then followed by biomass and final electricity. 
the relative similarity uh, between hydrogen and uh, uh, nitrogen means that hydrogen is uh, likely to be suitable for many processes, uh, which currently fueled by gas, including uh, the direct heating at high temperature, where the processes gas intact with uh, the end product, such as steel heating and the gas melting, where biomass and the electricity are unlikely to unlikely to be suitable. If there's a local own uh, carbon storage capacity and uh, uh, public and the regulator support for carbon storage, maybe CCS is uh, also a, a good option. Uh, I believe the main challenge facing, currently facing uh, industrial heating includes the following aspects. First, decarbonization falls behind other sectors such as power, transport, and uh, building. Second, increasing uh, requirements of dynamic operation for uh, system response, recovery, and uh, resilience. Uh, third, industrial heat is often generated on site and a variety of temperature level for different processes from hundreds to thousand degree uh, Celsius. Thus, the technology options are generally not interchangeable. This, those uh, uh, challenges indicate that there is uh, no one site fit all solution for decarbonization of uh, industry heating. Besides challenges, industrial heating decarbonization also has its own pain point. <clears throat> For example, large investment and low profit. Fluctuations in price make the uh, uh, industry struggles at the break even now. For example, the average, uh, the weighted average net profit margin of a steel company fell from about uh, 5% in uh, 2017 to about 3% in 2018, remain well below its uh, uh, 2004 records level of almost 10%. <clears throat> Last but not least, it's a <clears throat> it's a homogeneous product competition, and the generational change of uh, production line, it's a very slow. For example, oxygen <clears throat> converter steel making has a, has been around since uh, 1950, and uh, we still use it today, and also the steel heating and the rolling technology. Faced with the challenges and industrial pain points, we should have an objective understanding of the decarbonization pathway of industrial heating. Do we want to take a evolutionary pathway or the revolutionary pathway? <clears throat> the former is a slow, but a reliable and a, uh, continuous. The later is a rapid, but risky and uh, sporadic. Or over the Last, over the past few decades, we have uh, put a lot of effort in single process uh, energy efficiency, but due to physical constraints, we have achieved limited success and uh, getting closer and closer to the bottleneck. <clears throat> we, we desperately need a <clears throat> disruptive innovation to further enhance energy efficiency and uh, deploy decarbonization technology like uh, uh, fuel switching and uh, electrification and the uh, CCS, so on and so forth. Though it may be a revolutionary pathway. Here, I would like to take talk about the next generation industrial heating technology by taking the steel heating process as an example. We all know that the heating furnace is a major energy consumer in the hot rolling process of each steel plant. Each bullet needs to be hit to a certain temperature before subsequent rolling operations can be performed. For a production quality reason, it's necessary to tightly control the stock, the discharge temperature and, the, and its temperature uniformity. 
This can be uh, difficult to achieve since bullets are increasingly uh, required to, to be uh, operated in a transient manner to cope with the variations in such as in product properties, uh, throughput, and the need for handle production delays. If the product quality doesn't meet the requirements, it may be required to rework or and thus energy loss uh, and also too high heating temperature or too long heating time can also cause scale loss and uh, pro product reject. <laughs> Currently, supervisory control systems are widely used in uh, reheating furnace. In, in a common design, the temperature control is mainly divided into three different levels. At each time instance, the level two tracks desired temperature profile and uh, determines the temperature set point for each control zone of a furnace according to the scheduling of stock desired discharge temperature and the uh, instantaneous thermal uh, state of the furnace. At this level, stock temperature are estimated by the uh, heat transfer model to avoid costly uh, measurement. Then the level one uh, calculates the required heat input to each zone to reach the temperature set point given by the level two. However, the supervisory control system has its uh, inherent disadvantage that uh, essentially aims to regulate the stock discharge temperature and the temperature uniformity by adjusting the heat input. Thus, when the operation changes from one state to another state, it doesn't attempt to optimize the furnace efficiency. Considering the challenges and the industry pain points, I often wonder, is there a way that we can increase policy efficiency without making large scale hardware or process transformations. The heating furnace usually has a high degree of automation control system and the complete IT environment. And there are few data out there. The, temp the temperature time series changes of the data are relatively smooth, which, mean, which meets the lead of data modeling. However, currently, 60 to 70 of industry data is not uh, used. Therefore, we can find out the key factor affecting the specific energy consumption through AI algorithm to from the massive measure data. Then the machine learning measure can be used to establish a prediction model of these measured values and the specific energy consumption aiming at uh, the lowest energy consumption so as to realize the reduction of energy consumption but, but not compromise the production quality. In this way, though we can't improve the efficiency by 20 uh, or 30 percent, but uh, one to five percent is uh, still possible. If we want to further improve the energy efficiency and the resilience of the system, then the digital twin technology is needed. Data and the virtual model are essential uh, components. Here, data can, can be used to maximize the energy efficiency, as I mentioned in previous slides. Well, system re resilience can only rely on the predictions of the virtual model, which are required to be faster and accurate. A popular type of virtual model is the data-based model. There is a huge volume of idle data in the uh, industry, which can be used to generate data-based model. For, for example, we can use those data to train a neural network model to predict some known conditions in the red color. However, as mentioned before, usually there are few data out there in steel heating, but doesn't mean that that will not happen at all. Once that happens, the database model will likely fail to handle it correctly. That's why many self-driving system test, test the extreme conditions to collect data. But are we willing to use this, use the industrial heating line to test the extreme conditions? Of course not. 
So we still need the physics based model. One that is widely used is the CFD model. Though it can generate a detailed local result, including temperature, pressure, and uh, velocity, it's very time consuming, especially in industrial scale application. Considering this and the digital twins renounce our models, there is a lead for advanced physics model, a physics based model here, which need to be uh, have real time computing speed, but also have an accurate to meet industrial application. One alternative method is the Hotel's zone method. The basic idea of the method is to split the computational domain into a rather coarse zone, including surface and volume zone, according to the specific application, and uh, apply heat and mass balance to each zone. It will generate a set of equations which can be solved sober, numerically. This avoids solving complex and time consuming radiative transfer equations and therefore can uh, generate, uh, can greatly improve the computing speed of the model. I have dedicated in, uh, in development and application of zone method in foundation industries since uh, 2013. And it has been successfully applied to the steel reheating furnace, glass melting furnace, uh, uh, steel steam reforming furnace, and the acetylene cracking furnace. I believe this is a promising method to integrate with next generation control system of industrial heating process. Recently, we have put forward a research proposal together with the University of Exeter and the South Wales to further develop the zonal method in the open source open form framework by adding a new zonal mesh structure library by doing so, the radiative heat transfer modeling is calculated on a coarse zone representation of the geometry, whereas the, the flu mechanics, mechanics is calculated on a finer finite volume mesh as needed. Building on this, the, the whole uh, zonal method of radiation analysis can be fully implemented in the open, open form uh, framework. The furnace model developed using this method can not only meet the control system requirement for model com computing speed, but also meet the industrial application requirement for accuracy. By integrating the zonal model, for future furnace control system can realize not only uh, feedback uh, um, composite control of temperature set point to uh, eliminate uh, unmeasurable disturbance, but also uh, feed forward composite control of heat input to, to optimize dynamic uh, uh, operation problems such as uh, energy efficiency during batch operation and the production delay. The, the modeling framework developed is also uh, applicable to other heating processes in the foundation industry. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, you can. Um, we will be able to take questions by chat and you can, you're available to answer anything that comes through, is that correct, on, on specific uh, things? Okay, thank you. That okay. Um, if there's one or two burning questions right now, uh, I will open up the forum just for a minute, but the majority of questions and discursive aspects of today can be dealt with in the Q&A. Is there anything specific right now for you can that you wish to ask? Um, I can you can do a raised hand if you wish. Okay. I've got one burning question. You presented a whole range of scenarios for increasing efficiency and therefore reducing energy. Um, and clearly your favorite is the hotel. Uh, one, because that's your research area, which is absolutely understandable. We all know that we all love our own research areas. But um, can you imagine all of these things being rolled out in combination? And if so, what kind of overall energy saving in a percentage could you envisage in the future? As I said, the, we just uh, provide a tool for energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy use in the future. 
what I mean is we can use this tool as a tool to uh, future research. For example, for uh, fuel switching, you use uh, hydrogen and other renewable fuels. And uh, this tool can also can be used for control purpose to integrate with the current uh, uh, fluid control system. Okay. And also can be used as a, a virtual tool in a digital twin. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, you can. I have noticed there's a question in the chat for you. And I think I will leave you to answer that question. If you just look to the chat function, you can okay, there is a message from Shavingi, and it's directly absolutely to you. But I think in the interests of time and keeping to the schedule, we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you. And uh, can you put up the uh, 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 briefly put up the agenda again, Neil? Okay, so we've just had a fantastic uh, talk from Yukon, and we're now moving on to Alessandra, who's going to be telling us about modeling and optimization based control of flexible energy resources, uh, resources, resources for sustainable energy systems. And I do believe, Alessandra, you're going to present also from your yeah. own computer. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to hand over to you if that's okay. Thank you. Yes. So I can share my screen. Thank you very much, um, Ian, for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I am um, I'm very happy to be here, um, however, virtually. Um, and I'm Alessandra Parisio. I'm a senior lecturer in the Power and Energy Division within the Tripoli Department at the University of Manchester. And I have a PhD in automatic control. I am a control uh, uh, engineer, but I have been applying uh, um, control, especially one advanced control methodology I would like to talk to you about today, uh, to energy systems, um, buildings, microgrids, and now energy networks uh, in, in general. So the, in this talk, I would like actually to give you an overview of this advanced control methodology, uh, which is called model predictive control, and uh, you might uh, know it. And uh, this uh, has been applied to industry since 1980, and is being now applied to uh, within the power and energy uh, areas. Uh, and it's very, it's very promising uh, control design. It's a basically control design methodology, um, and it's very likely to become a standard within the power and energy uh, fields as well in the near uh, future. Um, so this is the outline of the talk, uh, and uh, so I will uh, um, I will start with giving you some a highlight um, an overview also the of the research uh, area I am mainly involved in the motivation for these studies. Uh, then I will, uh, as you mentioned, give you uh, discuss with you some uh, features of this uh, um, control uh, methodology. And I will share with you also some experimental results um, and uh, give you an example of how this control methodology might be applied uh, to industrial environments. And, I, and then I will conclude with some uh, remarks, concluding remarks. Um, so um, before outlining, uh, as I mentioned, the, the more technical aspects, I would like to spend some time describing the research context, which uh, is uh, now very uh, well known. Um, so we are, uh, as uh, we all know, uh, we are witnessing a major shift in the uh, power um, in the power grid uh, to help the future power system addressing the uh, challenges of, of uh, meeting and increasing energy demand and uh, decarbonization. Um, therefore, it is expected uh, that uh, over the coming decades. Uh, there will be thousands of distributed energy resources like, uh, of course, photovoltaics and wind turbines, uh, but also electric vehicles and heat pumps uh, will be uh, then connected to distribution networks by all types of consumers. And um, uh, these aspects along with uh, these uh, resources, along with uh, utility level renewable energy sources, of course, can give uh, uh, environmental and economic benefits uh, on one hand, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they challenge the uh, operation, the stability of the power grid. 
to mitigate these challenges, uh, system operators are exploring new solutions and new sources of flexibility, such as storage, uh, embedded into the distribution network. Uh, and actually, uh, in this context, flexibility plays a key role. Uh, flexibility is basically the uh, power system ability or the system ability to cope with events that may cause imbalances between supply and demand at different time uh, frames uh, while maintaining the, sub the reliability of the system in a cost-effective manner. So this is the uh, definition. And actually power system have always needed flexibility, it's not a new concept or a new need. Uh, but if we want to increase the penetration of the renewable energy sources and decarbonize the entire energy sector, so not just the electricity one, but also heat and transport uh, ones, um, we uh, need to um, more much more flexibility and we need uh, more flexibility sources, and we need also new tools, management and control tools, to uh, optimally operate all these new flexibility sources. And another, flex uh, another flexibility uh, source is also the interaction among different energy vectors. This is another important source of flexibility, which would also require different modeling approaches, a whole system model approach, uh, or a multi-energy uh, uh, modeling and control approach um, so as to uh, co-optimize not only uh, the electricity demand but also the uh, heat and cooling demand, uh, for example. Uh, so in this, uh, in this picture in the bottom left, I just provide a high-level scheme, an example of the multi-energy systems where uh, uh, you can find devices such as uh, heat pumps, which basically couples different energy forms, uh, thermal and electrical storage systems. And uh, um, basically, uh, these energy uh, supply sources are uh, have to be optimally uh, operated so as to meet uh, different types of energy demands, uh, as you can see here, electricity, heat, and uh, cooling, uh, for example. And actually, intelligent industries might be considered, intelligent uh, industrial buildings might be considered as multi-energy systems themselves, where more and more active energy systems, um, because you might have on-site uh, generation, power heat generation, uh, electrical and thermal energy storage, renewable sources. So all these energy, active energy system interact and, and uh, um, of course, there is the additional challenge of meeting the production targets and the constraints. Um, so um, flexibility resources in general uh, can provide several benefits to the power grid and can support the climate goals and the decarbonization of the overall energy uh, grid. Um, actually, they can here I just list some of the possible potential benefits. Uh, so they can improve the frequency response, deliver the uh, uh, power in either direction. Uh, they can reduce the need to curtail clean energy, uh, clean power from wind and uh, solar plants in uh, time of congestion, grid congestion. And um, they can support the local uh, network stability, providing also voltage support through the converters and, and so on. Uh, but uh, and of course, in order uh, for these flexibility providers uh, to do so, uh, we need uh, novel market services and market structures in order to enable the participation of these flexibility providers uh, in the energy and in the uh, in the power uh, grid. Um, and currently, uh, there is not uh, um, basically. Um, there is not any uh, decision and uh, management tool that uh, can optimally manage uh, the uh, operation of flexible resources, especially in a multi-energy uh, context. So there is the need of decision-making systems for the optimal operation of these flexible energy sources, along with 
standard uh, of constraints and objectives. Uh, furthermore, these uh, um, energy resources should be uh, optimally managed. So meaning that uh, there are goals that we are interested in and we want to achieve. Goals might be diverse. We, are, we might be interested in cost and emission minimization. We want to improve the energy efficiency. And uh, uh, we might also want to support the operation of uh, a more sustainable uh, power grid and thus uh, provide service uh, to the power grid. And uh, in order to do that, so uh, we need advanced uh, approaches and especially an optimization-based approach. So, and a methodology that allow a very flexible uh, control design because the types of um, systems that we have to uh, consider is very diverse and also the types of constraints and uh, targets uh, is diverse. Um, so one of the most promising methodology uh, is this model uh, predictive control, which is basically on a dynamic model, which is basic uh, based on a dynamic model uh, of a system we want to control. Um, in this uh, slide, uh, I, there is a high level scheme uh, of how this uh, methodology uh, works. So we basically have here an optimizer, which includes a dynamic predictive model of the system to control, and the model can be also data-driven, of course. And uh, uh, basically, uh, and also uh, this optimization problem includes, of course, relevant constraints and the desired targets and other information of interest, for example, weather forecast. Uh, forecast. And this means that a dynamic optimization problem is solved over a given prediction horizon and a, a sequence of optimal control actions is uh, yielded to be applied to the real system, to the real process. However, only the first of this sequence of control actions is applied to the system. Um, and uh, the resulting, and um, uh, for example, and the resulting outputs, which could be, for example, uh, the indoor temperature in a building climate control uh, problem. Um, is, um, is measured or estimated. And this information is fed back to the uh, optimizer again, and a new problem is solved over a shifted control horizon, uh, yielding a new sequence of control inputs uh, based on updated information uh, on the, about the system. So this uh, process is repeated uh, again on a regular time basis. It could be, depends on the uh, system of interest, could be every five seconds, five minutes, five hours. And in this, uh, in this way, the, uh, the system is optimally uh, op con um, controlled. And um, as I mentioned before, these techniques have been uh, applied uh, uh, since uh, 1918. Uh, starting with process control in chemical plants on oil refineries, and now it's being applied to power plants and power electronics, and it's basically the standard for advanced control in the process industry. But as I mentioned, it's, a, uh, it's more a design, control design methodology, and the research in MPC is very active. And currently, the uh, more active area of research, areas of research, mainly um, regard the stochastic MPC, which basically an MPC controller that consider that embeds uh, within the control design, within the optimization problem, information about the uncertainty sources affecting the system, and uh, learning-based MPC, which combines MPC with machine learning, artificial intelligence, basically it's um, wants to understand how to extract information relevant to the control design out of uh, data that are available more and more uh, nowadays. Uh, this is the typical use of MPC within the industry. And basically in this uh, control hierarchy uh, is uh, usually uh, placed in the middle. Uh, so basically we have a steady state optimization where uh, the 
a static optimization problem is solved based on uh, economic aspects without considering the dynamics of the, the process. And uh, the MPC in, um, instead, uh, um, with the tracking uh, goal, consider the dynamics of the process and try to steer the process uh, uh, so as to achieve uh, this uh, economic uh, optimal set point. And uh, it calculates other set points uh, to actuators to be sent to low level controllers, which act on a much faster time scale. Uh, and recently, there is also a trend to combine these two uh, uh, layer, uh, higher la um, layers uh, into one single layer, which is also convenient in terms of uh, infra control, control infrastructure. Uh, within one single layer, which is MPC combined with economic costs, and it's called economic MPC. So you can see that uh, uh, there is a wide range of different uh, variants of this uh, uh, control technology that can be uh, considered. Um, so these are uh, some of the um, advantages of this uh, uh, control uh, technology. Um, so it offers the a possibility of uh, systematically use data forecasts and measurements. As I mentioned, it, it is based on future behavior on a model of the system. So to um, predict future behavior of the system and prepare it for the upcoming uh, events. It can uh, integrate different types of constraints, operational, technical, economic, intertemporal, and also a feedback mechanisms which make the control action more uh, robust against unknown disturbances. And uh, it can include different types of control objectives. There, are a, there is a, match, a mature uh, code and development tools available, and it's a very flexible uh, control design. Uh, there are a couple of drawbacks, uh, of course, uh, but uh, there are also uh, different uh, variants that uh, uh, can uh, um, uh, mitigate these drawbacks. Um, now, I would like just to uh, briefly describe two experimental case studies, just to give an idea of the type of the level of improvement that uh, can be achieved by more advanced control uh, NPC variants. Uh, like the stochastic model predictive control that accounts for in uncertainty. In this case, uh, uh, we applied this technology to microgrids. Microgrids are basically sub networks, uh, sub uh, power networks. Uh, so basically clusters of uh, uh, load uh, generators uh, uh, and storage devices, which uh, basically provide uh, energy uh, to a local area. And uh, uh, the goal of this uh, strategy is to minimize both the running costs and uh, the emissions while satisfying the uh, energy demand. And we applied this stochastic model to this control uh, uh, to a, an experimental microgrid located in Greece. Uh, these are uh, uh, the units uh, included in these experimental microgrids. We had the photovoltaic generators, uh, battery systems, uh, different types of uh, uh, loads, both controllable and uncontrollable, and uh, one uh, fuel cell and one combined heater power unit. It, uh, uh, the microgrid runs on the low voltage three phase electric network. And the MPC algorithm was implemented on an MPC interface with the SCADA system that, of course, operated all the units. Um, so just to give, we uh, uh, carried uh, experiments over two months in the March and April. And uh, uh, here I just uh, give some, uh, some results. Uh, so uh, the deterministic uh, uh, MPC, the deterministic MPC is the uh, MPC without considering any uncertainty sources, uh, was able to uh, achieve up to 30% of cost saving over the uh, current control uh, technique they used to operate normally the microgrid. And then we um, also um, compare the deterministic uh, against the stochastic MPC. So the stochastic MPC considered the uncertainty in the uh, renewable generation and in the, in the load. Um, and uh, uh, 
furthermore, with the stochastic NPC, uh, you might also put a weight on the objective you are more interested in. For example, uh, this uh, uh, NPC OE uh, put a weight of 70% on the running cost and 30% of the on the emissions, meaning that uh, you are more um, you prefer you are mostly interested in minimizing the running cost, but you want to also partially consider the emission reduction. So you can vary this um, uh, weight and achieve different trade-offs between the emissions and the uh, reduction. And um, uh, as a summary of the, um, of the re experimental results that we uh, achieved, uh, the stochastic MPC can yield up to 35% of cost saving and uh, a significant uh, emission reduction over the deterministic uh, um, version. So considering the uncertainty sources might be advantageous. And uh, in this other example, we applied uh, again the stochastic model predictive control approach uh, to control the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, conditioning system uh, within university buildings located in Stockholm in uh, Sweden. We considered we wanted to uh, optimize to control both the indoor temperature and the CO2 levels by uh, using these heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, which are responsible for the thermal comfort and the air quality within uh, our building. Um, and uh, the stochastic, uh, because it considers the weather and occupancy uncertainty. Um, and uh, it was also uh, implementable uh, on low cost hardware platform. We, uh, also running experimental results on the uh, HVAC system uh, in the university building uh, there, as I mentioned. Um, here is just a scheme of the typical HVAC system that they have there. And we had the sensors available, uh, for example, to measure the temperature and CO2 level. Uh, and then uh, as actuators, as control input, we could decide uh, air damper uh, position and the opening position of the valves uh, in the cooling system and of the radiators. And uh, here is uh, just an example. So we run experiment over uh, uh, four months in, uh, uh, from February uh, till uh, May uh, in Sweden. And this is just an example of the type of the amount of energy saving that is possible to achieve uh, with respect, of course, to the current practice, the current control, pra uh, existing control that they had, uh, they used there uh, normally. So uh, savings were up to 31 or 33%. Uh, um, and um, here, uh, um, I provide a possible NPC architecture for energy management and decision making in industrial environments with the aim to co-optimize both the energy use and the production objectives. Of course, this poses a significant challenge to both modeling and control design uh, because since the energy dynamics and the pro production dynamics and requirements must be captured and the energy costs and emissions must be addressed along with the production objectives. And um, one, uh, I, I would like to also consider the possibility to offer uh, flexible services to the uh, network operator and be paid for it. This is partially already done, but uh, uh, the energy is not optimized with, along with the uh, production uh, objectives. Now, since the industrial side energy and uh, production management is a very complex optimization problem that spans multiple time scales and layers of decision making, uh, basically the ineffective decision making framework is expected to be hierarchically and distributed, hierarchical and distributed. So uh, the industrial environment might be divided into to three different types of dynamical interactive components or cells, I call them cells here. Uh, each cell is equipped with a uh, cell optimizer. 
uh, while there is an industry coordinator, uh, coordinator that has a global view to respond to the energy market condition and satisfy also the customer's needs. Uh, production cells, as we can see here, are um, basically uh, cells where production activities can take place and specific machines are used. But uh, we have also distributed resources cells uh, where uh, the, op uh, the optimizer of this type of cells uh, can take advantages of the available local generation in order to support the interaction between the electricity, heat, and gas energy vectors, for example, reducing the energy losses for heating. And then we have also the service cells that consider specific uh, special thermal air quality requirements in the industrial building, basically optimizing the HVAC operation. Now, an advanced type of MPC design can be used to effectively uh, and uh, optimally operate all these cells in a coordinating matter, which is called uh, distributed MPC, which is also computationally uh, more um, very promising. Uh, and it can also, uh, it has also the capability to exploit new data capabilities uh, to characterize, for example, equipment and identify energy intensive uh, processes and then coordinate the energy management uh, along with the production uh, schedule. The collection of um, large amounts of data uh, could happen through cloud-based platforms and that can help uh, parameter estimation, uh, uncertainty handling, monitoring and optimization uh, tasks. And here I just give some example of possible cost functions constraints and uncertainty sources that, that can be considered for uh, uh, an MPC for intelligent industries. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, in trade-off between several uh, objectives can be achieved, um, uh, minimizing energy use costs or CO2 emissions, maximizing the profit uh, coming from service provision, and of course, uh, specific production objectives can also be uh, considered. As modeling constraints, uh, we can include process dynamics, uh, production requirements, but also thermal storage dynamics, uh, operating modes of the various distributed, uh, local distributed generators uh, that can be uh, available uh, in the industrial site, um, and also the interaction with the grid. And there might be also different uncertainty sources uh, to be considered. Uh, process related uncertainty sources or renewable generation or the customer demand and there are different uh, uh, mathematical ways to uh, model and represent all these aspects and uh, so i would like just to draw some concluding remarks um, so um, i try to give an overview of this uh, possible optimization control approach that has the a high potential to improve the energy efficient efficiency and minimize costs and emissions uh, this uh, approach uh, mpc approach is very rich uh, and flexible and there is a variance a, a large set of variants uh, that can solve a wide range of problems and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is, it is likely to become a standard for energy and power application. And um, it uh, can be also a promising methodology for energy management and decision making in industries uh, to uh, derive uh, cost effective, not only cost effective, but also environmentally friendly production plants. It can offer uh, robustness against uh, several sources of uncertainty. Uh, one is uh, uh, can uh, be interested in and uh, uh, non-standard objectives such as grid service provision can be included to contribute to more sustainable grid operation. Um, here is just uh, some references, uh, uh, really relevant references, and um, I conclude my talk here. Thank you very much for listening, uh, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Alessandra. That was fantastic. Um, extremely interesting. Are there any, before I start asking the loads of questions that I have, I'm going to open up the uh, 
for, uh, we, uh, to, the, to the wider group to ask questions. So any specific questions for, for Alessandra on what she's presented or in general about the, the research? Just, uh, got the participant list so I can see if anybody's got their hand up. So I'm going to ask questions. So what you have here, as far as I can see, is a generalized model for, for optimizing energy usage in almost anything. Uh, is that my general understanding reasonable, Alessandra? Um, it, it might sound very ambitious, but uh, uh, it's um, basically MPC, it's a uh, really controlled design me methodology, and the core is uh, uh, being able to derive a mathematical uh, um, description of the system and of the, uh, con of the objectives uh, we are interested in. So mm -hmm. in general, yes, it can be applicable to everything because nowadays now we have also, it, it, it is being applied also to power electronics. So something mm -hmm. that uh, runs over uh, microseconds uh, as a time scale because we have fast embedded MPC variants. Uh, the research is very, very active. And uh, one of the benefits I didn't mention is that there is a very strong theoretical foundation uh, as well. Now, theory in uh, a practical application might be uh, of limited interest, but uh, uh, it might offer some guarantees that uh, uh, of stability, for example, which is very important probably in the industrial uh, uh, processes. And it might uh, also uh, offer guarantees that the solution that you get is feasible, meaning that uh, it satisfies the constraint, the technical operational constraints you are interested in. So, so if, if essentially, if you can parameterize your process, you can apply your model. I'm yes. not, I yes. understand correct. Yes, yes, that's so. So, to date, do you know of any applications that have occurred? You've mentioned a couple of industries, but I mean, one of the reasons we asked you along today was to see if there was um, to, to discuss the application of your MPC mm -hmm. type approach to to the foundation industries. Are there any specific barriers that you could think of uh, or difficulties? Uh, to, to apply, I know you're not an expert in the foundation industries, but just no, your let's say how a, I don't know, a steel mill works. Uh, the, we all know the basic areas of steel mill. Are there any kind of issues? Uh, you know, you need to parameterize it. So you, I guess you need a lot of data. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, I, um, I did not mention the drawbacks. Uh, but there are, I just very briefly mentioned that there are drawbacks, but of course there are. Um, the main drawbacks is that you need a model of the system, uh, a dynamic model of the system, uh, because that will become a constraint, a, a constraint of the optima MPC optimization problem. Uh, now to derive models accurate, uh, relatively accurate. It's also a trade-off between complexity and the accuracy that has to be achieved, and it is also challenging itself. So, but you need a dynamic model of the system to be able to apply this uh, this technique. Um, now, the the and also the other uh, drawbacks is that you need online computational uh, requirements. There is an online uh, optimization problem that you have to solve. Um, and uh, that is why, uh, and also you need to characterize somehow the uncertainty sources that you, that you have. So you have a feedback mechanism that somehow provides you uh, some um, with some uh, robustness against unknown disturbances, but there is uh, there are disturbances you can uh, uh, gather uh, collect data uh, on like uh, weather forecasts or uh, people or I don't know in the industrial environment there might be many uh, customer demands uh, for example. Um, so the design phase is uh, might be uh, intensive, might be uh, challenging. But that is why the research is very active and there are now combination, uh, the, the researchers are looking at combination between MPC 
and the machine learning, for example, uh, that can really help with uh, uh, modeling the challenges and with the learning uh, mm -hmm. of the errors of the uncertainty uh, online. And there are also MPC variants that uh, can uh, um, move part of the computation offline and so that online there is just a simple function evaluation and there is this distributed MPC uh, approach which I briefly mentioned I didn't have the time to explain but it's also very very uh, promising because basically it decomposes it distributes the computational uh, burden to different agents uh, basically, they compose the problem into smaller and simpler optimization uh, problems. But it has to be done so that uh, you are uh, uh, the quality of the overall solution is guaranteed. Thank you, Alexander. I could ask you about another hundred questions because I think this is an this is a, an approach that needs to be very much explored. And you're right to work with modelers and obviously you know information technologists who can understand how to collect data very quickly. But I'm going to hand over to Bill, who has been patiently waiting while I stop talking. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Alexander. Really nice talk, and uh, I think you've sort of answered my question in your your response to to Ian just now, but. Um, I suppose the the, the 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 question I was going to ask was about whether the dynamical model could could be the kind of digital twin that we've heard uh, Ukun talk about, and and clearly from what you've just said, it it, it can be. So so I guess my my follow up is, are 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 you aware or are have people in? I know it's not so much been applied in industrial sectors yet, but have people taken? existing say digital twins where there are other sectors and maybe ahead of the of the foundation sectors in in developing digital twins and just being able to plug them in to to the the computational control framework that you you're, you're proposing or do they have to be developed in a, a, a bespoke way no um this is a very good, uh, good point uh, many thanks um actually i'm in the uh, researcher are considering the the combination uh, so the use of digital twins uh, for the design phase of the MPC. Uh, basically for the MPC, what is uh, uh, helpful is to develop a control oriented model uh, because it has to satisfy several, uh, some uh, uh, mathematical properties. Uh, so, so as to derive a problem that is uh, uh, easier to solve, but uh, you need to, to be aware of the simplification that you, um, that you do in your modeling. So digital twins can be um, uh, very helpful in uh, helping with the learning process if we combine MPC with the learning or to provide data uh, to apply system identification techniques and derive uh, control oriented models for the MPC. So I, I see that the, I think that the digital twins can be very helpful in the design phase, but also in the online uh, learning phase of this technique. Thank you. Thank you. You can um, just to, I'm going to ask a question of you and maybe link it to what uh, Alessandra is doing. Do you see a strong uh, potential connection between your approach, you can, and what Alexander is doing? You have models, you have a way of parameterizing uh, processes, and I'm, I'm not an expert, but there does seem to be a clear synergy between these two things. And, you know, if there is that such a strong synergy, your background, for example, in the foundation industries, and Alexandra's skills in the MPC could provide an interesting platform for the future. So could you comment on that, you can, and Alexandra? Of course. <clears throat> <clears throat> Actually, previously, I also uh, worked on the MPC model predictive control of uh, money uh, in touch with heating process. But uh, we find this is also very promising uh, uh, technology and it also can address the current limitation of the level two control system used in uh, widely used in uh, process heating and also can address the uh, energy efficiency during the uh, uh, transient operation. Yeah, mm -hmm. considering uh, the AI technology, the fast improvement, and in the future, actually the digital twin definitely rely on uh, data. In other words, 
the data-based model in the future will definitely be very powerful. But the only concern is that does the data we can collect it can really represent the real world? Of course not. As I just mentioned, there may be uh, out there data exists even in the the, the possibility are very low, but once happened, the data-based model definitely will fail to deal with it correctly. So in that that time, we still need to we still need to rely on the physics-based model. Otherwise, yes, because the foundation uh, production uh, process can, uh, cannot uh, uh, how to say because it's uh, very expensive. You can't, uh, uh, you definitely will not willing to lose it and, uh, or damage it to get some extreme condition. Of course, <laughs> of yeah. course, of course. And actually there was, uh, of course, in a limit um, and not as uh, uh, challenging or uh, as, um, uh, yes, challenging as in the foundation industry, but also in the building. Uh, they are very conservative. They are very concerned about the occupant's uh, comfort. So um, also in that case, it's difficult to uh, test or to do um, uh, um, to do something in the on the uh, actual building. Uh, so that's why the university building they are of course more uh, uh, flexible and. Um, and we relied on a, a gray box model. So we had uh, a um, partially physics based model of the system, but some of the parameters have to be learned um, out, of, uh, out of data, uh, basically. And, and this is also because uh, uh, it is important not to lose the physical interpretation of some of the variables of interest for uh, control purposes. Uh, but again, uh, uh, of course, as you mentioned, uh, modeling error, there are always errors. Uh, and that is also why MPC might, might help because it uh, allows to incorporate information also on the modeling errors. And I think that data can be used uh, also to learn about modeling error, errors online. So it's a learning process, but the more uh, the um, dynamic of the system are learned, the better the, the control performance should be. Thank you. Um, I, I generally think there is a, a huge amount of potential in, in, in uh, what we've heard this morning for, for the foundation industries. And I hope the people uh, who are on this uh, workshop uh, recognize that. I think this, this kind of approach needs to be investigated further. Perhaps there is perhaps potential of um, some kind of feasibility study, for example, who, who knows, for example, using TFI Network Plus funds to explore combinations of these two things. We have a call coming up soon. Um, you know, the, the money, the amount of money is not huge, but there's the potential there to at least uh, have, a, have a brief look at the possibility of combining the approaches described by Yukon and Alessandra. Um, you did say we would stop at, uh, I think it was 10 past and starting at 11 40 Neil is that correct uh yes yeah, so, so the plan is to have a break until 11 40 unless there's any more questions people would like to ask thanks thanks Neil thanks very much yeah, so um uh, but I still want to make sure that everybody's asked the questions they wish are to the speakers this morning before we uh, break for half an hour are there any further questions out there okay so Given that I've asked, I could ask another five questions. I'll not do that. I'll do that with Alessandra and Yukon uh, separately. Um, uh, I'm going to suggest that we take that break, which is scheduled for right now, and then we, we reconvene for two more talks in the topic of uh, Foundation Industry 4.0. We have uh, Julie McCann from Imperial College of London talking about Centers for Sustainability. And uh, our own Ash Tiwari from University of Sheffield on, on digital 
a digitization of skill intensive manufacturing processes. So they are going to be speaking from 11.40 onwards and we're going to have a very similar setup. There'll be time for a brief question, some um, chat questions as well, but then we'll have a Q&A at the end. And the idea is to kind of see if there's any outputs from this that could potentially be useful for the foundation industries, if not already there to be discussed. Okay, so thank you and we'll reconvene in some 28 minutes or so, so thank you very much. Hi, um, welcome back everybody. We'll just give people a couple of minutes as they uh, rejoin and uh, sit down to the computer with the coffees or whatever they've been doing in this break. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Judy McCann, who I believe has joined, she, you know, Judy could only join for the last uh, two talks, but we're very, very pleased to have her. Um, she's from Imperial College of London. Julie, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Oh, lovely, marvellous, thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, and I understand you're going to share your... Um, yes. Excellent, okay, so right, we're all on the same page. So when people say, um, no, you're going to do it, then I get scared, but definitely <laughs> we're on the same page on this one, that's really good. So we're just going to couple of minutes and then um, just get people back and thinking about the uh, the workshop. Just give people a minute, so it's... Uh, Would you like me to share my screen now? Yeah, that would be ideal. Thanks very much, Julie. Get it ready to go. That's a fantastic background you have there. Uh, <laughs> or you have one of the truly great houses on the planet. Yeah, true. Yeah, on, on my salary. <laughs> it's a background. <laughs> oh, what's happening here? Can you see my screen? Not at this stage. No. Coming through, I think. Yep, it's there. So, um, we'll just give one more minute to a 42, uh, and that will ensure that everybody who's going to come is here. Um, uh, I would imagine people slowly will come back if they have left, or, or they will sit down and recommence if they've left there. Link on. So I think we can get going now. Um, so we have Professor Julie McCann, uh, who's going to give us um, a talk on senses for sustainability. I, I'm very tempted to say sense and sensibility when I see this title, uh, but senses for sustainability, uh, the advantage and challenges of instrumenting processes to track and save materials. So please start when you're ready, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, all. Uh, how are you doing? I'm Julie McCann. Um, thanks for inviting me um, to your workshop um, today. Um, so I'm a computer scientist. So I'm coming in at this from a computer scientist perspective. Um, I have never worked, obviously, in, in the foundation industries in my, in my life, but I have played around with tools that, that can be used in those environments um, and have been used in, in similar environments um, to help with sensing. Um, it's funny that you call it sense and sensibility. I have had a talk once, which I did call sense and sensibility and sense in the city and all sorts of jokes therein. Anyway, this is a very, very long winded title because at the time of uh, chatting with, with uh, yourself, um, Ian, I was uh, not sure of what I wanted to talk about. So anyway, I, I've, I've, I've geared the talk around sustainability, but in truth, it's more than sustainability, as you will see. Anyway, some initial slides to show you where I'm coming from. Um, just to let you know, I head up a research lab that looks at the computer science elements of sensor-based systems. So I'm not necessarily inventing new sensors. I'm looking at, at the interactions of, uh, of the components of a sensor system, which includes the sensor, which includes the network, which includes the processing, machine learning, blah, 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 all on those small, low-powered devices. And it's that small, low-powered wireless sensing infrastructure that is my particular focus. So you'll see that my bias is towards that. 
I'm also part of uh, Alan Turing Institute, where I head up the data centric engineering theme of uh, critical infrastructures and how sensing impacts that. Um, and I'm also deputy director of Petrus, uh, which is a security, it focuses on security of the Internet of Things, and that includes obviously sensor based systems as well. So that's that's the kind of background that I'm coming from. OK, so a bit of background to my of my understanding uh, where sensors can be used in the foundation industries. Um, um, firstly, the first thing that that one learns is that they are uh, generally intensive in terms of the use of resources, but particularly in energy. Um, and I've worked in the past uh, at other with other energy um, intensive industries, whereby we were looking at ways of better understanding those processes. And to do that, we instrumented their systems um, and uh, their broader systems in general to identify where energy was being used. And from that, then we could bring people in to help understand where we could save energy or we could make dual use of the same energy through some form of recycling and so on. Um, and uh, in the foundation industries, um, recent reports are saying that 10% of the UK CO2 emissions come from these in in industries. So, so this is something that we want to look at, not just in terms of energy usage, but obviously uh, pollutions and things like that. So being able to monitor those allows us to be informed better about how we can um, change things. Um, so we want to be able to monitor and control the processes within these kinds of industries. Um, and how they interact with other processes to, pretend, to percept, have an idea of perhaps being able to recycle some issues or, or have some sort of, of looping around of, of, of outputs from one process to another. Um, now, this presents to us who are building sensor systems to be able to understand that state and to be able to get that data with a number of challenges of which I'll articulate today. One of which is that the environments themselves in which the sensors need to be the, within uh, present a, a very hostile environment. You know, there's high temperatures which impact the sensor systems uh, ability to read what it's, uh, the data it's supposed to be reading impacts its lifetime and so on. And I'll, I'll articulate that further throughout the rest of this short talk. So this to me is why I'm interested in these kinds of, of applications of sensor systems, because I have to build better sensor-based sensor infrastructures to allow them to survive in these more challenging environments. So um, a lot of what I've been talking about comes with the whole promises of Industry 4.0. As you know, the whole Industry 4.0 thing is where we move on from just having computers monitoring um, our systems and some sort of light robotics. The, the whole notion of cyber physical interaction comes with Industry 4.0, where we start to automate and make autonomous some elements of these kinds of systems. Now, the promises that, that have come with this seamless uh, connection between the physical and digital world through robotics and IoT um, are things like, for example, resource efficiencies, uh, generally, specifically energies in the case of the foundational industries, uh, the potential to that, towards that, understanding process flows better, um, also reporting in real time what's happening with those systems so that one can take action immediately, um, and so on. Um, it also should be able to provide for um, technologies that permit uh, more flexible processes and indeed inexpensive individual individualization through things like additive manufacture and so on. So, so these kinds of systems, because the recording state, the sensor based system records state, that means we can make decisions based on that state through valves, through actions of a robot uh, and actuators generally, and therefore we can make it more autonomous, more automatic. So we can also allow these this information to uh, be put through simulators, through digital twins, through other uh, mechanisms so that we can look to see how we can optimize those production processes to maximize income from those processes and minimize uh, what could be considered negative like costs or indeed pollution and so on. Um, and it allows us to be more adaptable to external influences. So not only are we able to do more flexible processing, but as, as things change, as pricing, for example, of incoming um, materials change, we can start to change how we and adapt our, our uh, actual processes, our production processes and so on, if we have better information about the state. So to be able to do this, obviously we need to have more sensor usage. Um, 
and and this also leads to better process control efficiencies as i said before and hopefully reduce downtime so you'll be able to better predict the condition of your assets and so on so that if you have better predictions about for example failure or deterioration you can order components in advance while uh, costs are low so that you have them ready for when that um, you know, upgrade or whatever needs to happen. So we start to look at condition monitoring, um, monitoring and condition prediction and so on. You can also do better asset tracking in terms of uh, firstly, uh, storage and, and transport, that is where your, your, your raw materials are uh, and, and what the provenance of those materials are. So for example, there is a movement at the moment looking into um, how you know uh, foam batteries and so on are composed and where the raw materials of that comes from. And there's a movement towards putting tags on the actual materials to indicate their provenance in a, in a secure way from the very source of where, where that material has come from. Um, and also understanding where in your plants, where your items are and how they're stored and the conditions of storing them also helps with your production scheduling as well. Um, and all the other infrastructure. So if you have that information, you're able to do these things. And again, as I said before, you can look at condition monitoring of the different systems in the environment and do prediction across that as well. It allows us to be able to uh, inform, uh, conf, uh, conf, um, oh, my head's gone, inform about the assessment and the accuracy of, of how we are conforming to regulations uh, and allows us to do it in a relatively objective way. In other words, that state information can give indications of pollutions coming off. And I've worked in the past with um, some oil fields where indeed a lot of the different oil fields came together to build a sensor-based system to measure the, 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 uh, the, the gases that were coming off the oil fields to have indications of, of how well they're capturing that and how, how much is being leaked further off site. And this is for themselves to, to tweak their own infrastructure, but also for government as well. And then we can also get this information in, in real time. So if we do see something that's going wrong, we, we can do something about it if there's a leak, for example. Um, and also with the, the element of automation that comes with these kinds of systems, we, we can have less human intensive processes. Um, and indeed, because they inform things like robotics and control systems, this, this automation as such, then maybe can allow us to have a more safe environment for where other people are working as well. Anyway, um, no conversation about sensor-based systems and uh, uh, Industry 4.0 um, can ha happen without the description of a digital twin. Um, and there's five different levels of the, the, the twin. The twin is essentially uh, models of the physical infrastructure. Um, these can be manifest in a number of different ways using different types of mathematical techniques. And they can pre be presented to our, our users or our operators in different ways as well, in terms of, uh, for example, simulations or uh, numbers as, as mathematical numbers, or indeed it could be some sort of uh, very pretty thing, as you can see in the screen here, screen here in some sort of maybe indeed virtual reality reality environment for training or for in some sort of um, more you know human interface oriented uh, pr presentation um, now the digital twin systems are useful because it allows us to not only just monitor what's going on in that physical system but it allows us to extend that through different systems of systems to understand how it flows into that system and how it flows out outwards uh, are impacting those other systems. It allows us to do things like, for example, predict what could happen next. It allows us to optimize the system. And then also it allows us to do what if, what if we change this? What if we tweak that sets of parameters? It allows us to understand that. And then an autonomous, the level five digital twin is basically where we have some form of, of control in the system that's behaving uh, against the information that it has, which are the, the model of the system plus the data that's coming in, usually in, in relative real time, to be able to, to act on behalf of users. So we've got this notion of different elements of digital twins. Now, when you put, put sensors into systems, especially low powered and, and wireless sensors, it brings a number of challenges. The first one obviously is that sensors themselves, depending on how they're uh, designed, the sensors are usually quite noisy, so we have to be able to separate out, separate out the, the data itself from the noise. Uh, they're prone to decalibration, uh, depending on the type of sensor, so we have to have a, a regime of being able to recalibrate the sensors. In some systems, they can be misplaced, 
that can be compromised. There are a number of attacks on sensors that can be used that are very physical attacks to be able to make them misread. And um, they can degrade over time generally. Um, and the systems themselves that support them behave individually. That is the box is holding the sensors that is, is taking the data off them and processing it, but also as a network of sensors as well, where we've got numbers of different data sources uh, coming together and that data is fused. So we have to look at a lot of these and the impact of the veracity of that data on, um, on the system. Now, one, one example of um, how to overcome these problems is to accept them. OK, and what we do in, in a lot of these systems is we either over um, we over specify the actual sensor system and pour more money basically into it, or we use a lot of self adaptation where the computer system itself is monitoring its own behavior and reporting its own behavior, not on like you're reporting your process control system and trying to get it to better work. We do the exact same. We see the sensor network as our physical system, and we uh, model that and report back on its behaviors. We also program it with self adaptation. Now, self adaptation is basically where the system with minimal information because it doesn't have an awful lot of processing capacity with minimal information is able to make decisions and adapt to failure and adapt around holes and networks and so on and a lot of the techniques we use are not unlike what we see in nature in swarming systems and so on one of the big thing is unlike natural systems we can't have these sensors scurrying around the factory floor looking for energy so we have to obtain energy and there's a lot of research now looking at at how we can use, uh, how we can both obtain um, energy from the local environment, the natural environment in which the sensor system is. So for example, the example I've got here is looking at solar panels, um, or for example, you could use vibration and other things, and to be able to make efficient use of that energy. And our efficient use for us is being able to schedule the processing of the sensor-based system in terms of the sensor and the onboard processing to condition, condition the um, data and send it up to where it needs to go, but also, um, look at how those batteries determine uh, are deteriorate over time and to be able to ensure that they, min, um, the cost of maintenance of such systems is as low as possible. One thing we're also looking at is how we can obtain energy from not just the traditional sort of vibrational and solar, but also things like how we can obtain energy from uh, the Wi-Fi, the local Wi-Fi uh, uh, that's surrounding, and we can actually get um, uh, energy from that to power up our sensors. So we're looking towards battery-less sensor-based systems. The other challenge that we have is high on earth, we get all these systems to talk in your messy sort of metallic environments, but also where there's lots of other sensor systems talking at the same time. And so we look at, for example, some uh, network protocols that use low powered wide area. Um, communications that is, you know, it's it's using very minimal energy um, on the sensor device, but it can go multi kilometer distances across large spaces that can send the data. Um, now, there's a number of challenges with that. The theory, for example, doesn't match the reality of that. And so we investigate different ways of doing that. One different way of doing that is to look at what's called a uh, NOMA. And that's where we turn the notion of networking on its head. Normally, when we have networks, we want to avoid the different networks communicating and um, interfering with each other. In this particular case, we actually want them to interfere with each other. So what we do is we get let them interfere with each other, as you can see from the, the second um, graph there, the uh, non-orthogonal graph. And what we do is we pull in that signal, the, the communication signal. And what we do is we use very clever signal processing to grab the strongest signal. In this case, it will be that big green signal there. And we grab that signal and we output it. So that's our first message through. And then we look at the next strongest signal, which is in this case, our purple signal. And when we can decode that and we go down as far as we can with the signals where we're getting what would be considered accurate data through. And that means that many people can, or many systems can, can share the error. Essentially, they can actually send their data at the same time. So we're looking at more efficient, low powered ways of sending data across our networks. When we have control in the loop, then we have another set of challenges. Now I've talked about the, the, the nature of self-adaptivity and the um, system having to 
measure its environment and work as best it can within those environments. That brings a notion of stochasticness to the behavior of these kinds of systems, which in turn then has impacts on things like bounded delays, uh, packet loss, clock skew, and, and things like that. So in other words, the data coming into any system that relies on the data coming in at a certain time with a certain timestamp um, and of a certain level of accuracy and so on are impacted by these. Control systems are one particular application. So we've been looking at different ways that we can, with all those stochastic nature behaviors of our sensor system, allow a control system to operate the way it would if everything was accurate and timely, um, but also to bring about the same levels of confidence and truthfulness for that control system so that it can operate. And we've applied these to situations such as uh, water distribution networks and so on um, that, that operate over multi-kilometers. So this allows us to do many clever things. So for example, one of them is on the network, the water network, we're able to um, you know, detect leaks and actually within 50 centimeters uh, be able to determine where that leak was. And we've won awards for that particular piece of work. We're also working in Singapore, um, looking at how we can um, build better water collection systems so that uh, the water collection in Singapore, the rainwater is not wasted. And we have uh, an infrastructure there that consists of these, these large butts and tops of roofs, but we also have other infrastructure. And we schedule when the sensors work and obviously the types of data that they're pulling in so that we can understand better how we can make best use of that water so it doesn't go to waste. And we also look at how uh, these systems are impacted by security. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier was the self-adaptivity to keep these systems working at their optimal, but also it actually makes them a little bit more insecure as well, because you can, let's say, lead the system on to thinking um, into different behaviors due to the data. And what we've done is we've looked at all the different elements of sensor-based systems, and indeed where those sensor-based systems um, could be tampered with or maliciously interfered with and so on. And so we've been looking at that and, and building new protocols to overcome those. Now, earlier I mentioned one of the challenges that's particular to your environment, which is the actual environment in which you, you guys typically work which is in the, in the factories and so on with extreme conditions. Um, and so we've been looking at different ways of doing sensing whereby the sensors are not on the machinery that is being operated on in the factory. So the example here is one example is, is called RF TACO, which is a tachometer that's measuring uh, rotation speeds of motors and fans and things like that. Essentially what it does is instead of sitting physically on a device or a machine, it, or indeed sitting looking at a machine to measure some form of light. It can be even in a different room. And what it does, it sends a, a radio frequency signal uh, through that machine. And we listen, our system listens to the, the impact that that machine has made on the electromagnetic waves. We do the signal processing to grab out that signal. And from that, we can derive things like the vibration on the machine, we can derive the rotation speeds of anything that's rotating. And indeed, what we found when we were doing the experimentation, we could determine things like, for example, human heart rates, uh, people swinging their legs, and indeed, uh, whether someone was using a microwave oven, et cetera. So they, this kind of approach to sensing allows us to take away some of the danger and some of the complexity of being able to place sensors in and around um, these kinds of hot or, or interesting environments. And indeed, we actually took this work uh, because we determined that we were able to detect moisture. Um, and we've now also applied this very same set of technology to determine um, the growth of grapes in a vineyard. We can actually even do that with the very same notion. I'm going to leave with this last thing, which is looking at um, a water network as an example again. Um, and the reason I'm asking, I'm leaving you with this is because um, this is um, something that I, I see as a challenge to sensor people and people who are interested in digital twins and so on. And this is where we have a thing called physical interaction. And I've been sort of subliminally um, having little stars without title on it um, throughout the presentation. So what we've got here is our water network, which is the gray part. And this could be any form of pipeline network. On it, we have our sensors. 
and we have some actuators, in, in this case valves, and the aim is to get the water network to route round failure in better uh, than a, a current water network would do today, and to also make it more resilient and long lasting. Now we've built this computer system and unlike the, the physical system, it has its own constraints. It wants to minimize its use of energy so that it lasts as long as possible. It wants to maximize the accuracy of the data and it wants to minimize its delays in sending that data to the, to the controlled parts of the system. Now here's the thing, to get the system to last as long as we could, we stuck it on the water pipes and indeed the water pipes vibration were able to power the system up. Therefore, we could have a hundred odd year water pipe and a hundred odd year uh, sensor network to, to run uh, along with it. However, what we found was that uh, we had the advantage of being able to control the water down that water pipe to ensure that the sensor system had its energy. But in doing so, we were causing transients down the water pipe and that would shorten the lifetime of that pipe. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is an example of where the computer system's impacting the water system and the water system's impacting the computer system. And to get this to work properly, we needed to have designed both in conjunction with each other. And we have seen in other systems that we've built, the co-design of control systems and the computing infrastructure actually makes for both systems to be uh, built in a more robust and um, uh, better way. Some fun futures just to leave you with. Some of the things that we're working on is building um, sensors in, into the infrastructures as the infrastructure is being built and also 3D printing sensors in space. And also some of this, um, these sensors are being shrunk down to tiny sizes. This is one example there. And some of the, the more fun things that we work on are things like smart matter, et cetera. To give me an indication of where some of the science is going in that regard. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been a bit of a whistle stop tour of some of the things that I'm interested in uh, and I can take questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tio. That was fascinating. Um, I'm going to do a couple of questions. Uh, are you okay to stick around for the Q&A at the end, Julie? Yeah. Okay, okay. So then we'll have a, a broader discussion at the end, but let's take a couple of questions directly for Julie. I have several. I always have a lot of questions, which is perhaps a good thing since I'm the director of the network. Um, so um, is there anything before I, I side chip in, though? Because I thought it was a fantastic talk, a great oversight. Okay, so I'll take that as a, as a people telling me they want me to speak. Um, so <laughs> Julie, um, you know, one of the things I heard you say was that we were moving towards uh, autonom autonomous sensing devices or remote sensing devices. Um, how much how much further do we need to go? Is, is there kind of a, a off the shelf uh, systems that can be uh, put in place? Uh, there's a number of technologies, uh, energy harvesting for vibration, for heat, obviously light. Um, is this a done deal or do we need to push more in this direction? And the same question for the remote sensing where you're, you're you know, I guess you are looking at, you know, uh, some kind of digital processing and things like that, high resolution imaging for your, for the growth of your um, um, grapes, which I thought was lovely. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I guess there's other things, you know, the speed of something is a motion sensor, which can be done remotely by various technologies. Uh, wh where's your feeling? Is, is there kind of a vast array of things we need to do to enable these 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 uh, sensing and control systems to be rolled out in, in greater abundance? Okay, so so th that's that's quite a big question. The, yes. the, there are in existence, obviously, control systems and have been for some time. And, and what typically happens in a control system is that the, uh, the sensing infrastructure is over-provisioned. So we might have lots of sensors, that uh, co combinations of redundant sensors that exist so that we can for sure understand uh, what is going on. And these systems tend to use wired communications and wired power. And so, so essentially we've been our control systems maybe bar some some radio um, communications from, for example, um, uh, modern heart based protocols. Um, we basically have kept that technology very steady, but that technology is pretty much the same technology we had 20 years ago. Right. Now, in the meantime, we have had a lot of work, a lot of research and a lot of new technologies come out that are far lower cost 
easier to uh, fit to systems because of the retrofit uh, features of wirelessness and of battery powered or non-tethered systems. But we're, we're at the moment still in a position of people don't trust those wow. kinds of systems, right? And that's a trust issue. And, and the thing is, and the reason it's a trust issue is because of all the non-determinism that comes with radio, that comes with battery powered systems uh, and, and, and obvious fears that if you're driving something based on data, you want that data's uh, predictability um, to be as maximal as possible. So that is, that is still a sticking point. Now, um, there's a lot of uh, systems you know, that are just sitting around monitoring and um, not necessarily informing anything other than a human who can make some form of educated decision. Um, and those systems don't need to have those, those requirements. But I'm still not seeing an awful lot of those out in industry. In reality, we see some, but not an awful lot, certainly not at low part. But then in industry, you've got an awful lot of energy being used, for example, on these big infrastructures. So what's, you may as well plug your sensors in as well. So, so that's the very practical side of it. There is an awful lot of work to be done. Um, the way people design sensor-based systems is, is like being back in the 1950s um, designing computer systems like data centers. Um, since the 1950s, we've been looking at ways of both so software engineering and systems engineering large computer systems, but also at how we verify and provide guarantees of those systems. I'm afraid that the area of sensor-based systems is way behind. It has not got a specific method of, of being able to provide guarantees about uh, qualities of data, of qualities of information processing, of uptimes and all those. We don't have that really. And we really need to work on that. So that to me is a, a research area. And it's also my further argument that that needs to be done in conjunction with the physical environment in which those sensors go into. And that's two things. That's the actual, you know, the air around it, the temperature, the blah, blah, blah. It's also what it, the sensor is supposed to be doing with the physical environment. So if it's reporting on it, then we are able to understand the veracity of that data if we understand what temperature that the measurement of that data was taken at. And so those kinds of things need to be done for us to start getting trust in these kinds of more uh, non-deterministic systems, in my opinion. That's an excellent answer. You, you clearly pointed out the issues, trust. And for me, the big one was, we probably do a bunch of tests on whatever remote sensing technology we think they're going to use, and we do them in laboratory conditions. And so we trust the data. But if we're having those, that information coming from something where the temperature may vary, the pressure may vary, you know, the, the vibrations may vary, um, that's going to cause um, potential, not necessarily yeah. actual, but potential variations in the data, which again creates a trust issue. That's really fascinating. And it's not even just variations in the data coming off of the sensors. The actual radio systems, the, no the noise floor of uh, the, the communication system changes with temperature and humidity and so on. And that can impact whether or not a message has been delivered faithfully or not. If it's not been delivered, it usually goes for resend or something like that. But then that has further down the road impacts on delays then. And if you have a control system with delays because messages are bouncing back uh, because of the environment change, then 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 there's an issue there. So it's an, again to do with the trust as well. So I'm, I'm hearing temperature stable or ambient stable devices and temperature stable, ambient stable. Uh, then that costs a fortune, then you can't have that. So this is it. I mean, in a way, a big data center is in a temperature uh, uh, controlled environment, if you think about it. No, the, the actual device works over yeah. temperature. We have antennas that will work over yeah. a couple of hundred degrees. Or, or we just put more sensors into them and report that with it. And then we know what to do with that uh, data. Okay. So you it doesn't the... have to be costly. It doesn't have to be restrictive and costly. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, fascinating. Again, I could go on forever in a day. Um, but we have to move on to, so thank you, Julie, that was marvellous. Uh, but we do now, because I've gone way over time chatting away, uh, and we're going to have to move on quickly to uh, Ash Tiwari from the University of Sheffield, who's going to be presenting on digitalization of skill intensive manufacturing processes. And I believe you're also going to present from your computer, Ash, is that correct? Yes, that's right, and I'm going to share my screen. Okay, thank you. All right, you go, in your own time.
Sorry, can I just check uh, if you can see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay, perfect, perfect. So let's let me make a start. Uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is uh, Ash Tiwari. I'm uh, EMBS and Royal Academy of Engineering Professor in Digital Manufacturing. I sit in the Department of Automatic Control and Systems Engineering uh, here in the University of, of, of Sheffield. Uh, now, in this presentation, I, I'm I'm going to talk about uh, a, a, a very unique aspect of Industry 4.0. I'm going to look at the applications of industry 4.0 to skill intensive tasks, manual tasks in manufacturing. Um, this is an area which is relatively under-researched. However, it offers us huge potential for productivity improvements, both in the short and in the long term. So I'm going to talk about how industry 4.0 technologies can help in improving the productivity of the, the skill intensive tasks we have in manufacturing processes. A lot of my experience in manufacturing is from the aerospace sector, from the automotive sector and power sector. So I work in discrete manufacturing, high value manufacturing sector. I have limited experience uh, of, the, of the foundation industry. So I do want to apologize if I make an incorrect assumption there. However, I, I do strongly believe that, that, uh, that my presentation will, will, will perhaps um, initiate a lot, a lot of interesting cross sector conversations that we can have in terms of technologies that have been useful across the various sectors in industry 4.0. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that the will open up a, 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 an interesting conversation for, for us. Um, okay, let me now move to the, to the next slide. Um, now, as I was preparing for this presentation, um, I, was, um, I was tempted to look at some of the, 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 the pictures of, of, uh, of, of uh, sites inside the foundation industries. And uh, a number of these, these pictures featured people in there, uh, which was not a surprise for me, but I, was, um, I, I, I then went into looking at what activities people do in foundation industries. And broadly speaking, there were kind of four things I, I, I noticed, and we can, we can discuss that later, whether my, my observation is correct, but I saw four, four types of activities. One, active, one set of activities around manual handling, uh, material handling. So, handling of materials, taking parts from one, one, one process to the other, a lot of human intervention there. Um, I saw also a lot of activities in setup. So there may be two processes that are automated, but the setup of those automated processes requires manual intervention, requires people to do those parameter settings. I also saw some manipulation in process. So material manipulation when a process is being carried out. So, so that's another interesting observation I saw. And the fourth category I saw was a lot of still manual measurements happening. Number of pictures of, of, um, of, 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 of gauges and so on, where somebody has to manually record those activities. And particularly that happens in legacy uh, processes, but still a lot of manual recording of, of measurements going on. So that, 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 that really encouraged me. And I, I thought, okay, there, there is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people in uh, engagement in this. And therefore some of the research I do uh, primarily in the aerospace, automotive, and power sectors could potentially have implication in the work that happens in foundation industries as well. So in this presentation, I'm going to give you some examples of that and, and, and hopefully open up conversations later on. Okay, now what is the vision of what we are going to talk about today? Um, the key objective here is to lead to step increase in productivity and how we want to do it by investigating and developing new techniques for digitalization of skill intensive manual tasks in manufacturing. And the methodology for that is to see how the human interactions with the workpiece, so the workpiece is the, is the kit we are working on, interactions work with in both manual and semi-automated process. So we want to use sensors to observe how human interactions and workpiece interactions in manufacturing work. We want to observe them digitalize them and use that for increasing productivity. That is the kind of philosophy we want to adopt here. And the concept of that is, 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 uh, is, is very simple and it's summarized in this, this particular slide. Um, on the top, it, it talks about the, the technical concept and on the bottom, it talks about the applications that, that are opened up if we are able to solve the technical challenge there. Now on the top left, you see digitalization of human actions. A lot of work has happened in this area, understanding human actions, getting body coordinate joints, understanding them. A lot of papers you see, research you see in that area. On the top right, you see digitalization of objects and environments. Again, in computer vision, a lot of work has happened in observing um, work pieces, objects uh, at, at various temperatures, their deformation, understanding their deformation and so on. 
However, a real interesting opportunity arises if we are able to correlate the two. So if we are able to correlate human actions with the impact of that, their actions on the objects and environments in manufacturing, that opens up a number of interesting applications for us. Because through that, we can get a cause and effect link between human actions and their impact on the, on the environment. And if we are able to get that complete digital footprint of a manual process, we can use it for various applications. We can use it for visualization. So I'm now on the bottom part of the slide. We can use it for simulation, very accurate simulations of the factory to see how much of volume will be produced within a set time. We can use it for data-based ergonomics and productivity assessments. We can also use it for training and skill demonstrations. And we can use it for productivity enhancements by using the data for in-process monitoring and inspection of manual activities with the aim to potentially reduce or even eliminate expensive downstream inspections. And all that is giving us a lot of very valuable data where we can look at intelligent automation which can support some of the human activities in future. So it, it, it all is moving us towards increasing the, the, the work environment for people and having automation support uh, whenever and wherever possible. Okay. Now, the concept of this research um, is, is, is to understand how human and workpiece interactions work through a set of sensors on the shop floor. Now, as humans, uh, we, are, we are very good in working in, in complex, difficult environments uh, because we can we work on the workpieces, we observe how our workpiece, our environment, our object we are working on is behaving, and then we use that feedback to, 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 to modify our behavior until we reach the final outcome. In this research, we use a set of sensors and machine learning algorithms uh, behind those sensors to understand that human workpiece interactions. And how we do this, um, I'm going to talk about in, 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 a, in, in a minute, but what is important is what we need to do or what technology enablers we need to have to, to allow for that interaction between human and workpiece to be, to be captured. And this is, this is very timely at the moment to talk about this, uh, this area of research. And the reason is this, that there are a number of now digitalization enablers that are, that are available to us now. Um, for example, we now have, have sensors like, like Connect, uh, Azure Connect, for example, that can give us very accurate body coordinates of, uh, of, 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 of a person. We also have uh, uh, tools like Sense3D that can allow us to, to, to 3D scan a manufacturing environment we can, as far as go into finger movements, uh, uh, peregrine globes, sleep motion can give us quite accurate data about finger movements. And also on visualization side, we have a number of advancements with Oculus Rift, HTC Vive. We can now have a virtual reality capabilities on the desk of an engineer. So the combination of the digitalization capability for human actions and the environment, along with visualization capability, provides us quite a timely opportunity for us to start looking at the manual activities on the shop floor and see what, what can we do, what support can be provided so that some of the productivity enhancements could be achieved for those, those manual activities. Now, uh, before I, I tell you a little bit of, of technical details on what lies underneath the, the, the principles I'm talking about here, uh, let me demonstrate a very simple example. It's, it's an oversimplified example to demonstrate the point to you. Um, and then this particular research was a uh, finalist at EPSR, EPSRC ICT Pioneers Award. It talks about the digitalization of, an, of a simple four-legged IKEA SM, uh, table, which you see here on the, on the left here. The bottom graphs uh, capture the, the, the motions, and the right side captures the, the, the status of the workpiece. And you see here, the process starts. Um, the, the person now will, will assemble the second leg, and it will be recorded both in terms of human actions and the, and the workpiece states. He assembles a third leg, makes a deliberate sequence error. Uh, the person is not told that you have made an error. Live data is recorded and the correction then happens. The correction is also recorded and the process continues. So what has happened here is that there is a vision-based system which has a machine learning algorithm behind it, which has been trained to know the right sequence of of the workpiece of the four leg table. So in what sequence this, this should be assembled. And it also knows what a person should be doing so that this table is assembled in the right sequence. And it matches that. It knows how to match the two. So it, it, it looks for human actions, it looks at workpiece states and looks for anomalies in the process. So what, what it has really done is converted the standard operating instructions from a manufacturing environment 
into uh, a machine vision system that can look for anomalies in the process. And if there are mistakes, it could be pointed out. Um, if there are corrections, that could also be recorded. And at the end, we have a complete digital footprint of the process uh, to such an extent that we can reduce downstream inspections and start moving towards digital certification of some of these activities. So that's a, that's a simple example of, of, of what's happening here. Now, let, let me tell you what's underneath it. Um, what's, what's the system that lies underneath that, that example? I'll, I'll repeat the, the left part of this, this image to you. The concept is very simple. What we want to do, we want to learn from how humans interact with the manufacturing environment. And if we can have a set of sensors that allow us to learn that, then we can use it for a number of applications. There are six steps we have in our framework um, underneath the system. Um, the first is we capture data. And the capture of data is not only the data of the human actions, but also the data about the workpiece states. So we can use a number of depth imaging algorithms to capture workpiece states. We can use various skeleton tracking algorithms to capture uh, human action states. We then segment it. So we timestamp various activities and we segment it. And we look for interesting segments. We look at in this particular time segment, the workpiece did this, and, in and, and the human has done that in this segment to cause that, that workpiece to behave in this way. So we start looking at time segments across the workpiece states and across the human states. Now we can model it. We can see what states the workpiece has gone through. Gone through. So for example, in the IKEA table example, it has gone through five states with no leg, first leg, second leg, third leg, and fourth leg. We, we have five states of that, of that table. And within each of those steps that have been installed, we can also look at what states a person has gone through. So what a person has done to assemble the, the, that extra leg. So we can look at the states of the workpiece we can look at the states of the human actions. We can then link them through, in this example, we have used hidden Markov model, which is a machine learning algorithm. We can link those human actions and observable workpiece states through cause and effect probabilities through, through a machine learning algorithm. We can then develop multiple of these models for each observation we have of the workpiece. And from that, we can extract what are the most likely ways of doing an action and what are the, the most unlikely ways of doing an action and which of these actions does comply with the standard operating instructions. So we can decode this, we can understand what is going on there. And then uh, we can reproduce those in the digital world uh, that can then be used for in-process inspection. It can be used for training and a number of other applications that I'll demonstrate to you in this presentation. So this is a, a, a very quick tool of what lies underneath it. It's basically a combination of of sensors that capture human actions and workpiece states and machine learning algorithms that can allow us to link the human actions with the workpiece states through cause and effect probabilities. That is what lies underneath the system. Now, in the rest of this presentation, in the next uh, eight minutes or so, I'm, I'm going to give you a few examples of, of where this research has been used in industry and for what type of applications. Uh, let me start with this, um, uh, the, the, this slide here. Um, the, um, the, the application here is the application of ergonomics, so let me go back, of ergonomics and productivity assessment. So the, the concept here is, 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 is very simple. As we have seen in the previous slide, we have a system that's capturing the human actions and workpiece states. The first thing we could do is use data for ergonomics and productivity assessments. And I'm going to show you this, um, this video here very quickly. So you see, uh, this is a, a mock-up of an overhead assembly installation uh, for, uh, for an aircraft wing. And you see here the, the, the body states, the angles of the person being recorded. Uh, this is done in real time. So on the right side, you see a graph where the neck angle, the left shoulder, the right shoulder, and the back angles could all be plotted. And we can compare that with the health and safety executive guidelines and see for what percentage of time or for what activities we are actually crossing the HSE guidelines. So it gives us data-based assessment of ergonomics. On the bottom table, we can go further. We can look at productivity assessments. We can look at how much time each step has taken. And in a given step, how much was a value-added activity versus activities where we, were we, where we were adjusting something or looking for the right tool to happen. So we can carry out productivity assessments um, with this data as well, with, with real data available to us. Now this slide here uh, shows us, let me move this, yeah. This slide here shows us the same setup, but looked at from the bottom. So rather than looking at the person, it's looking at the installation of the task itself. 
Now, again, the same philosophy. The system knows in what sequence the pipe has to be installed. It knows what a person should do to install those pipes, and it's inspecting it in real time. So you see here, it sees a misalignment, and it says pipe one misaligned. It prompts the person to correct it, and you will see when the person has corrected it, you, you, it removes that, that, that error message, um, asks the person to move ahead and install pipe three, and the process then continues. So what we're doing here is we are not only providing support to people as they are doing an activity, but we are also inspecting the activity that has been done and ensuring that all steps have been, have been followed. Now, such an installation could actually uh, be enhanced. So the current setup here does not use weight sensors, but at the bottom, you see weight sensors integrated with the, with the gloves people, people wear uh, on the shop floor, where we can get an indication of how much weight is being carried and it can, it can really help, in, uh, help in, in, in real time ergonomics assessments. So this is an interesting application of what can we do um, with the, the sensor setup that, 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 that I, was, I was talking about earlier. But what, what more we can do? It's, it's very easy to look at a four legged IKEA table or an overhead installation of, of pipings. But can this work for, for more complex work pieces, for more complex manufacturing environments? Uh, where, for, where, for example, this deformation of the objects as they are being, they are being created. And this is a piece of research uh, uh, I carried out jointly with the, with the, with the PSRC Center in, in Composites Manufacturing in Bristol uh, in their labs. And the same concept here is applied to a composite fabric. So that's a deformable fabric laid on a metallic mold. So the sequence of actions here, layup here becomes important. Otherwise, we are going to end up getting wrinkles and other defects. So what is happening here, the system is again, has again been trained in the right steps. So from an overhead projector, you will see the system will ask the person to focus on a particular area to lay the fabric. You see this happens now, and the person starts laying it. Now, what a very interesting thing is happening here. It's the system is comparing the surface normal of the cloth with the surface normal of the metallic mold. And when they align, it tells us that, okay, this step has been finished. Please move to the next step. And it then takes a person step by step through the process. The sequence, as I mentioned here, is important. And, 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 and the quality control also happens because of the way the visual inspection has been programmed into the system. So that's another example of the same system being applied, but in a different environment where the object that the person is working on is deformable, uh, but it has to be done in a particular sequence so that the, 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 so that the right quality could be achieved at the, at the end. Okay, now um, a, a very interesting problem sometimes I, I face uh, when I'm looking at digitalization is the is the challenge of legacy processes, and particularly those processes that have that have that have been there for many decades, where there is there is uh, manual inspection or manual measurements going on, and I'm going to give you a, a live example of this piece of research. Uh, this is a piece of research I carried out with an SME in the Sheffield City region where we worked on a legacy facility. It's a 20 year old facility. It's an e-coating e -coating plant. So electrophoretic uh, uh, coating, um, uh, electro painting facility where the inspection of this had to happen three times in, in, a, in a day without gap. Uh, the reason is this, that it is prone to overflow if the filter gets clogged. So pre temperature pressure measurements had to happen three times a, a day throughout the, the, the year, 365 days in, in a year, uh, in a difficult environment. So we were brought into this in a legacy facility. Uh, the first step is we looked at digitalization of the process itself. So we looked at what measurements were currently made, how they were made, and what alternative sensors are available to us. Then we made an architecture where we installed the sensors on the shop floor. Uh, we used Siemens MindSphere launch, uh, MindSphere prototype, where we could get the data from all those sensors and have a dashboard that could be presented to the company where the data from those sensors could be seen and correlated. <clears throat> this is an example of the facility. So there are three types of measurements we made. We made pressure me measurements, we made flow measurements, we made um, temperature measurements. Uh, we also installed some, some local computing devices so that uh, some assessments and analysis could be done closer to the device so that real-time assessments could be made. Plus, we also had the infrastructure where the data was stored so that over a period of medium to long term, we can, we can see any changes in the setup or any trends in the data. Um, I'll not go into the details of the data, but, but in, in just uh, 15 days, 
the same amount of data was collected uh, with one data point every second that was collected in seven years of manual inspection. So seven years of manual inspection, three data points in a day. Uh, we had the same data, a um, volume of data collected in 15 days uh, with, with, with per second uh, frequency of data collection. So we got, we got quite a good insight into the process and that had immediate advantages. We could achieve better process control. It helped us in controlling the volume of paint used, quality and, and waste issues were reduced. Asset life was increased, so we knew exactly when the filter needs to be changed, and that helped in increasing the filter life by 20%. Overflow issues of the paint were removed, so the unplanned downtime was reduced by around 80%. And I think very importantly, uh, we, we supported people um, in, in an environment where they had to go for manual uh, manual inspection, so that, that, that could be moved uh, offline and remotely, uh, especially when COVID restrictions were in, in place. So it did help in controlling the process and and maintaining the quality and even enhancing the quality without actually being there to monitor uh, the, the process three times a day. So and another example of, of, of the work that has that has happened with the same philosophy. Uh, now, um, I'm going to give you another, another example, and this is the last example I'm going to use. Uh, the data we collect about the process can actually be used for simulate manufacturing facility as well. And this is a piece of research we carried out with, with, with uh, the GE uh, through Innovate UK funding. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through, through this very quickly. What happened there is, is an electronics line we were observing. So we had sensors on the assembly line that was collecting data around the, 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 the speed at which the production is happening. It was also helping people in inspecting the electronic devices that were being assembled. Now with that, we could get real cycle times uh, that were being, being, being observed on the shop floor. And that cycle time was then, 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 then used and updated on the cloud measurement system, which get, gets then picked up by, by G's optimization workbench. So G, G system would, would read from this file that this is the current cycle time they are, they are seeing at the moment. And uh, from that cycle time, uh, they, could, they could predict the future. So they could run a simulation and say that, okay, with the current cycle times, that's the kind of target we are going to achieve. Um, and, and would that be sufficient for the, for the promises we have made to the customer or to the delivery? And, and that allows the operations managers to make changes on the shop floor, to redeploy resources to meet the, 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 the target. So that another example of how the data can actually be used for system level simulation in manufacturing. So uh, I'm, I'm going to now finish with uh, a, a future vision um, of what are the areas that are important in this area. I think the first important area is the, is the consideration of legacy processes and machines. How do we instrument legacy machines where there is involvement of people with the machine? How do we work with that? Then human activities, uh, human interventions, instrumenting of those, working with those interventions. Then looking at the environment itself, the trays, trolleys, the material handling devices, how can some of that digitalization be worked to give us real visibility on the shop floor? And then the integration of those data sets can create very exciting opportunities for us to reduce the kind of non-value added time in manufacturing, like reducing setup, reducing inspections, and, 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 and such like activities. So with that, I'm, I'm going to close the presentation. I would like to thank the, 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 the collaborators of this and would welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ash. That was fascinating. I love the idea of marrying the digitalization of human involvement alongside that of the machine involvement. I think that's absolutely interesting. Um, so I, I, I guess the, the big question is you've given examples. Sorry, I'm just going to go straight in and ask some questions here, but we'll take further questions. But I'm again fascinated by this. Um, I guess the big question is, to my mind, is that we wouldn't we're about the foundation industries and the network plus. So is, is what would you what would be the perceived barriers for the uptake of, of your overarching kind of digitalization scenario that you presented uh, in your last slide there? What would be the barriers that you could see um, that would be would create not not absolute difficult impossibilities, but more difficulties in the foundation industries? Uh, uh, Ian, uh, I, I have from my experience of other sectors, I've seen two main barriers. Uh, they're not technical barriers. But they are the barriers which are around adoption of those technologies in the shop world. Uh, the first barrier is around uh, uh, the, the change in the skill sets. So as you move, for example, from, from manual measurement to a system where somebody can, you, you need to observe the data rather than go there and measure, it requires some upskilling to happen. And, and sometimes there's a, there's a perceived risk that people feel in that change. 
Uh, and, and that's one, one area I've seen. The second area I've seen is then there is people involvement in a process. And if that process is being observed, then the, the unions need, need to be involved in that. And the data collection has to happen with some level of anonymity um, so, that, so that any mistakes cannot be attributed to an individual. And that has to be very carefully managed with the, with, with, with the union. So these are the two things. Technologically, I've seen that once these concerns are removed, it, 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 there, are, there are no real issues in its adoption of the shop floor. Yeah, I mean, it, it, a very famous movie with Peter Sellers in the 1960s where time and motion caused a lot of problems with humans uh, in the factory. So there is, you know, there is even a, um, a historical aspect to this where time and motion men were brought in in the 1950s and 60s. This is an incredibly advanced version of looking at what people do in terms of the, the, the um, digitalization of skills. Uh, and you can see that there would be the same... Um, uh, the same issues with, with, with unions. I can absolutely see that. And the anonymity is, is vital. That's fascinating. I never I wouldn't I wouldn't have jumped that immediately, but I would have probably guessed that the um uh, the, the skills, the upskilling of the uh, workforce required because that has come up multiple times uh, as a barrier to the implementation of many different new processes and next generation processes. Um, I'm going to stop talking. I apologize. I find this incredibly interesting. And I'm going to hand over to, to Cam on this. He has a question. Hi, hi Ash. Your, your presentation uh, it was really interesting and it was really good to see that the human interaction element of this coming in. And you, you alluded to this really in your previous answer, but it's something that I want to explore a little bit more, perhaps with a bit more of a technological slant. And that was just thinking that there's almost something Orwellian, right, about about the way that you're observing people and their efficiency. Yeah. So the equivalent is, as you said, from the workforce perspective, is kind of having one person stood behind every person in the factory, yeah. monitoring yeah. their progress as if they were some sort of machine. So the yeah. ethical implications of this are quite interesting. Yeah. So I appreciate that that's a whole branch of research kind yeah. of on its own. But is there anything about the way that this, te that this technology is being developed yeah. and could be developed that yes. would protect against some of those ethical considerations? Uh, I, I think, Cameron, that's a, that's a fantastic question, and I have I've dealt with it for the, for, for the last 10 years quite extensively with, with, with my, my industrial collaborators. Uh, the way this technology is developing, Cameron, at the moment is for self-certification, self-inspection. So it's a tool set available where rather than somebody else using that to, to monitor, a, I can certify my own task. I think that is the way it's taking us, it, it, it's developing. Um, there is another strand to it, uh, and which, which perhaps uh, technically also very interesting is, um, here what you're capturing is not the video of an individual, it's just the, the, the data coordinates of what is happening there. So unless you, you really want to, it's difficult to attribute the data to a, to a particular individual. So that anonymity can be immediately guaranteed in conversations. But the most important thing is to use this technology to increase uh, the, the efficiency in terms of reducing errors, reducing downstream inspections, and allowing empowering people so that they can certify their activities themselves rather than somebody downstream doing it for them. And then that goes against their performance measurement. Uh, I, this is, this is the, the, the angle, Cameron, that, 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 that we are taking. Yeah, thanks. I, I can I can I understand that. I guess the problem is 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 that the law of unintended consequences is not a reason not to implement the the, the, the technology. But um, yeah, the, I, I guess the, the potential to to build anonymity into this is important. And I, just because I've I know nothing about this area at all, if Ian will allow me a quick follow up, is um, is uh, is there anything coming down the track in terms of policy or legislation around these types of technologies that that might enforce that level of anonymity to stop companies from, or nefarious actors from 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 using this technology for evil, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, Cameron, uh, what I have seen so far is that um, uh, the the the, the conversation. Okay. In in terms of the the standard regulations and so on, I, I think all the, the the standard regulations about personal data apply here. So if, if you start associating the data with, with an individual, then I, you, know, you are in breach of, of multiple things there, particularly if the data can be used for 
even health conditions. It, it, it's not very difficult to, to analyze that. So I, I think the standard protocols for personal data need to be applied here. Um, however, the most important thing is this, that it, it, if, if the data is used in such a way that it not only is, has an efficiency and productivity and up, an empowering angle to it, but also an ergonomics and welfare angle to it, which becomes important. So it, it can, if it can guarantee to an individual that what you're doing is within HSC guidelines, which sometimes is, is very difficult to guarantee because you don't have real data on the processes. But with such a system, you start getting that visibility at, at, a, at an individual operator level. So it, it needs to be looked at as a comprehensive package, which is about the work environment, also helping in efficiency, but also empowering people. And I, I think that's the direction we'll, we'll, we'll have to take Cameron on this. But, but in terms of the regulations, the personal data it has to be treated as personal data. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, are there any other questions from the audience today? Uh, I, I find that incredibly interesting. I've got a couple more for uh, one very general question for both speakers in the second half. If, if, if there's anybody out there wishes to uh, interject before I do. Um, there are some incredible numbers, Ash, there about uh, uh, downtime. And 80%, so I do listen to you, so you can, you know, because I'm quoting one of your slides now, 80% uh, downtime, or uh, reducing by 80% the downtime of, of equipment. Um, is, is that standard? Uh, I mean, is, is, can you, can you have, have you repeated that number? Because that's an incredible number. And Julia, the same question, do you see, uh, could, you know, do you see uh, where do these things have been applied? Um, you know, a, a massive increase in uh, productivity because of, in uh, reduction in downtime, um, and the same question to you as well. If you both can comment on that. Well, I start, Julie. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, um, uh, what is very interesting here is it, it was a facility that had operated uh, for 20 years or so, and um, um, and there were a number of unplanned down downtime incidents there, uh, primarily because the filter was getting clogged you have to, to stop the process and then you have to uh, to make sure that the cleaning happens uh, the whole process then stops uh, you have to reinstall the filter and and, and continue so uh, the the 80 percent uh, 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 reduction in, in in downtime is definitely possible Ian, because you you have replaced the manual somebody going their measurements and if it's a crisp and most of these these incidents were happening over holiday periods <laughs> So Christmas Eve, uh, New Year Eve, uh, Easter vacation periods where uh, rather than three, you could only make one measurement. And there were incidents of, of the, the paint coming out. Uh, so I, I think it, it's a conservative number. It's actually higher and it could be even higher than 80%. We should be able to reduce completely the, down, the unplanned downtime timing. And the second question for Julia, any experience of, of of these systems being these sensing and control systems being installed, have you observed uh, these these huge decreases in downtime? Is it this a uh, factor? In yeah. Okay. So so a couple of uh, examples. Um, one is uh, two in Singapore actually. One one was looking at a very similar, uh, to my view, uh, application to Ash, where we're looking at uh, filters impacting the operation of of um, uh, pneumatic uh, bin systems over in um, the the uh, flats in, in, in HDB flats in, in Singapore and and was understanding a couple of things. What we were trying to understand where smells were coming from and, and obviously that's an indicator of where filters are needing replaced. So they were able to, to schedule the filter maintenance in a way that um, brought downtime into minutes rather than you know something breaking and then then you have to get it fixed and you have to schedule all the maintenance teams in and do all that sort of thing. So it basically we're able to determine how far down they could let the filters run, um, <clears throat> and from there have the team ready on to swap over. Uh, and they could get efficiencies because they were able to uh, cross the whole of Singapore, then um, be able to understand better when things were starting to fail, so that they could bulk buy and things like that. Similarly, in the past, this is quite some time ago, I was working with um, <clears throat> uh, people who were working out in. Um, oil platforms and uh, they were looking at the maintenance from point of view of not only uh, downtime being a problem but the fact that any parts that they required took 
weeks and weeks to get to them. And so they had to have, they couldn't just wait till something broke and then order it because there's a six, six weeks uh, lead time on, on some of the parts. So they had to start looking to see how they, that we could measure deterioration so that again, that six weeks didn't happen. Um, that was a massive downtime that it hopefully held out until six weeks when the parts all came. So, and again, that helped there. Um, yeah, I think that's the two, two examples that I know for sure where downtime was um, uh, minimized as a result of being, you know, real some form of real-time tracking and real-time sensing systems. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a question for Alex Alessandra. Um, um, are you okay to answer that by yes. chat, Alessandra? Ah, oh. Yes, I, I was. I was doing so. I was uh, um, writing uh, in the writing down in the chat. The, the answer. If you need yes. to do it verbally, that's okay too. Sorry, uh, Ash and Julie, but, but this was a, a question from this morning uh, from Norman Swindles. Can you can answer verbally, Alessandra? Ah, okay. Um, yes, many thanks, uh, Norman, for uh, for the question. Um, absolutely, any source of information for the modeling can be helpful. Um, uh, the, the matter is to see if that can be this model can be directly applied. So I think that there must be, um, as usually uh, is, uh, a, a further step to develop, as I mentioned um, in the, the first half of the, uh, the workshop, um, a control oriented model because uh, it has to um, it needs to have the mathematical description needs to have certain a certain structure in order to be embedded into the MPC optimization problem and this can be definitely uh, done based on the model that you you uh, you mentioned I hope this uh, um, answers uh, your question or if you have any follow-up uh, questions happy to to answer also in the chat thank you alessandra uh, if you can if you continue that line of question in the chat uh, i'm going to open up for one more question from uh, the audience before i close the session up i think we're coming to the end of the period that we designated for this workshop so if there are any last questions uh, please proffer them now um Okay, I'm seeing no hands. So, uh, Neil, could you put up the uh, slide? Okay, so uh, just to conclude, um, uh, to thank everybody, it's it's. I've learned a lot. I've, uh, I've uh, and we've had a, a diverse session of talks on different aspects of next generation processes and foundation industry 4.0, as we've decided to call it. Um, there's a whole sequence of events, uh, but the most important one for this workshop is that we are going to open a call on this for our small project funding on Friday, the 11th of Feb. That will stay open until the 1st of April, so you've got plenty of time. We, we don't uh, do these three-week turnarounds that you sometimes see. We give people a good chance. Um, and just to remind people that um, these, these, these uh, small projects uh, must be in universities run by academics, but we're there's an anticipation that they will be linked to industry. So, um, so we want in-kind support, at least from industry, and strong collaboration with industry on these projects. It's one of the things we're pushing. And, of course, it must conform to work within the foundation uh, industries. Um, there's a whole bunch of terms and conditions around that, and you can read that on the call. But uh, foundation industries, next generation processes is the essential aspect of what we are looking to receive, and we will be we will make announcements of any kind of uh, successful projects that are going to be funded uh, around uh, probably the end of April, I think, is the, the time. Um, those can be up to six months in length, and we would also strongly encourage uh, early career researchers to apply also. Um, as we move through the, the year, we only do about six months in advance, so this is where we are at the moment because we like to react to the environment that's out there and information that we receive, and we're, we're planning uh, the six months uh, to the end of the year, but the first six months of the year, you see we have a, a fairly good schedule. We have an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion workshop, which is next month. We have a joint um, uh, meeting with the Transfire Hub which will be in May, and the schedule for that is looking incredibly exciting. Some 
good discursive stuff and an ability to present the things that the hub and the network have done in terms of funding of many projects and the results thereof. Um, we have a Joint e Futures Network Plus event um, where we again explore aspects of uh, uh, digitalization and, and, and such like uh, with the e Futures Network. Um, we will be doing a fourth funding call. We're discussing what that is at the moment, and I don't want to preempt it, but we have some very good ideas about that, uh, and that will be coming up in June. There's the Ceramics Expo, uh, which is only for one sector really, but we'll be have we have a stand at the Ceramics Expo um, uh, in uh, June, and that will be a face-to-face -face meeting. And there's a planned face-to-face -face meeting where we're organising a symposium, not the entire conference, a symposium uh, in uh, the MSSM 2022 meeting at Brunel. So that's the upcoming events. I hope you can attend some, and we would strongly encourage anybody on this call, academic or uh, and our industrialists to, to talk to each other and uh, come up with ideas for potential mini project, small project proposals uh, to be submitted by the 1st of April. We want to see this area grow, it's an important area and it's absolutely cross-sectoral. We've had examples from outside the foundation area, uh, industry sector, sectors, um, but hopefully you can see how much of that can be applied to the foundation industries if it's not being applied already. So, so we're looking, we, we, we established this workshop on that basis to try and look what was possible and come in uh, and bring things into the foundation areas. So it remains for me to thank the speakers. Uh, they've been marvellous, so thank you very much. And for you all for attending today, I, I, I've loved it. I've been absolutely fascinated uh, by every talk. I thought the standard was marvellous. So thank you very, very much. Big thumbs up from Bill there. Yes, I agree. So goodbye, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.